I've never done this before. No, me Good neither. Good afternoon, everyone, um, <laughs> and welcome to our Paddock Talk webinar. I'd like to welcome our panellists shortly. But for those that don't know me, I'm Belinda Hazel, and I'm Chair of Tasmanian Women in Agriculture. This webinar for you, we made sure that it was password access because of security issues that have been occurring that people might be made aware of from the Zoom platform. So we just wanted to make you aware that only legitimate people with the password have been able to access this webinar. So hopefully if any of you have any concerns about that, that's been alleviated. So I'm really pleased to run our second webinar and I would, on behalf of Tasmanian Women in Agriculture, would like to thank sincerely our panellists for making their time available to you over the next hour. I'll run through and introduce people shortly, but what we will do as a format is that we will ask each of the panellists to talk for about five minutes on some of the issues that they've seen in their respective sectors and how they've made adjustments to cater for those. And then what we will do is that we'll open the session up to Q&A so that you'll have the opportunity to direct your questions to whomever you would like to, to get some of your queries answered. So firstly, to start off with, we're delighted to have Massimo Miele join us on our By Tasmanian First Paddock talk. He'll be sharing his perspective of the impacts of COVID-19 on the hospitality industry and how we can all support Tasmanian producers and business owners during this challenging time. Massimo was born in Hobart and raised in Naples, and he incorporates his Italian heritage and his access to great Tasmanian produce to serve the best food, both in home and professionally. He currently aligns himself with the Audi Centre Hobart, Electrolux, and works closely with Pepper's Silo Hobart Restaurant, Grain of Silos in Northern Tasmania. He collaborates both locally and interstate to deliver quality ingredients with no fuss, which is fantastic. And he's focused on produce traceability, quality ingredients and provenance. He is focused on building a more productive and constructive relationship with our local food community to ensure we keep sharing deliciousness on our dinner table. So welcome Massimo and thank you for being available. Thank you. Um, thank you. Panelist is Leah Galvin from Eat World Tasmania, and she does some amazing work supporting Tasmanians to eat local and eat healthier. And she'll be sharing the Eat World Tasmania experience and how they're helping us to achieve that. Leah is the state manager for Eat World Tasmania. It's a not-for-profit business which receives their core funding from the Department of Health. Eat World Australia is an interesting space between eaters, the consumers, and the food sector. Currently, EatWell is developing a project to make stronger connections between Tasmanian home cook and all of the ways fresh food can be sourced in a dynamic environment that we now know as COVID-19. Home cooks are purchasing fresh ingredients differently and turning more towards supporting Tasmanian-owned businesses. And Leah's background is in public health, nutrition, and her passionate areas are local food procurement and food systems and how they influence what we eat. She moved to Tasmania from Central Victoria in 2012, and she's a current Churchill Fellow, which unfortunately she's unable to start her project at the moment, but I'm quite sure, Leah, that you'll be looking forward to, to getting that off the ground when we're allowed out again. So yeah, I'm in three weeks' time, so yeah, it, it's yeah. starting to sting. Yeah. Yes, I would say so. Mm. Thank you, Leah. Um, Thanks. Next is Andy Jackman from Red Cow Organics. And Red Cow Organics is a proudly um, family operated business. They have a herd made up of 300 gentle nat natured Aussie red cows, which have been in their family for over a decade. At the big pinnacle of the drought in Northern uh, Victoria, they made the life changing decision to pack up and move their dairy herds to the beautiful high rainfall area of Northwest Tasmania, where they purchased 155 hectare farm at Alzina. Three years on the dream of opening an artisan cheese factory have come true with a herd of Aussie red cows at their new venture, which they called Red Cow Organics. Andy's gonna share with us 
what makes your food and why we should understand the value of good quality nutrition. Good things take time and good things are worth waiting for, according to Andy, and I certainly believe that also. The cheeses are made with seasonality in mind and produced directly from the farm in her own boutique cheese factory. All the cheese is made with certified organic milk. They're passionate, committed, and certified, and are dedicated to making the best quality product from the purest organic milk. And she's going to be sharing some of her insights with us and how she's adjusted her business model in the current disruption that we're in. So welcome to Andy. Thanks, Thanks Andy. Lisa. Sam Wedgwood is available from Harvest Market. He's originally from South East New South Wales, where his family has a mixed farm. After extensive world travels and work experience in a variety of fields, it was his background that led him to tertiary studies in agriculture. Sam studied a Bachelor of Agriculture with a major in Agricultural Systems at the University of Tasmania in Hobart. He's since held roles in agricultural advocacy, policy development and project management, both in the public and private sector. As a member of the Launceston and Northern Tasmania community, Sam has been a volunteer director on various boards, including the Launceston Harvest Market, which he is now the president of since uh, this year. And he currently works for Rural Business TAS as a business programs coordinator. So welcome, Sam, and thank you again for being involved. Thank you for having me. Lastly, but not least, is Lucinda Seymour from the Tasma, uh, the Tamer Valley Business Association. Lucinda was born into a family of florists at the base of the Blue Mountains in Sydney's Greater West. She did, doesn't have the traditional upbringing working and studying from a young age in order to succeed in life. She's finished her schooling um, at a Loretto College at Normanhurst, I believe that is, Lucinda? Yeah, that is, yeah, boarding school. <laughs> Where she went on to set up her businesses and become members on various boards of the Sydney business community. She's jumped forward 20 years and she's now moved to rural Tasmania. Lucinda is now the proud owner of Moon Lily Kitchen and Cakes in Beaconsfield, as well as being the president of the newly formed Tamer Valley Business Association. So thank you, Lucinda, thank you. and thank you for making yourself available. Thank you. So we'll start probably with you, Massimo. If you could give us a bit of an overview of um, how you've adjusted your business, what you've seen from the hospitality sector. Yeah, well, um, well we actually closed the restaurant um, two weeks ago. Um, it was really difficult to kind of adjust to what was happening because it was moving so quickly. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, a lot of ideas were floating around about, um, do we change the model? Do we adapt? Do we do takeaway? Do we do online? Um, and that was very difficult because um, being a big restaurant, it, it takes a lot of training. There was a lot of staff and it was, it was just to, um, it was just very hard to kind of see through that. Um, so I've adjusted in my other areas of my business. Um, what have I, have I adjusted? I've just been focusing on um, staying positive, I think. Um, I think it's been, it's been very, it, it's been very um, complicated to, for businesses and restaurants to see what's going to be happening in the next six months in planning. You know, we don't know what we're planning for. So we're all been in a, a little bit of limbo. Um, and everyone deals with that in their own different ways. Um, I've kind of thrown myself into, you know, what I was doing before is that just focused on cooking good food and, and looking after my family and, and trying to make sure that um, that message of supporting local and, and supporting the farmers and growers doesn't disappear just because of the panic. Um, so I've really focused on that and, and made sure that um, my message from before is, is my message now. Um, with a bit more focus on um, uh, kind of value for money and what you can do for your family and uh, food wastes and all these kind of things and helping people. Everyone's at home now cooking, which is mm. fantastic um, to see. So I think giving people some tips and uh, helping along the way has been kind of what I've been focusing on and trying to get my kids to eat as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like hospitality is, is, is quite uncertain. So, um, it's a really hard one to kind of 
um, pick what's going to be happening. It's going to be a very different model when we do come back, whenever that is. Mm. I think, um, I think um, just making sure that we keep an eye, you know, what our ideas are and keep those um, ideas going in regards to looking after the growers. Because I think it's very easy. Um, this is when I started grain. The whole point of it was to not, um, you know, buy produce and order online and, and expect it to get there in the morning. It was all about really making that effort. And I think, um, you know, we really don't want to make sure when we do come back that we forget what, you know, what is important. Because mm -hmm. um, everyone's going to get used to a different, very different way of doing, ordering their food and where it comes from. Um, so if we don't lose, lose sight of that and forget those people, you know, I go to the markets and I know who I'm getting my meat from and all that kind of thing. To me, that is important and I hope that could be around and maintains, you know, it lasts the journey really. Yes, look, I, I think one of the interesting things, Massimo, that's come out of this is the reconnection of consumers to their local supply chain. It's been so easy for them to go into major retailers and purchase food from the fresh produce area without having the understanding or the direct connection of where that produce has come from. Mm. We know that there is the, the, the consumer that goes through into harvest market or a farm gate scenario, and we'll talk to Sam about that shortly, but I think one of the key things that, that I'm seeing is the desire from the community to reconnect with what's local. Yeah, and, and a great example of that is how quickly a lot of the, the growers, and I, I mean, to take you back, when all this kind of started to happen, I was devastated because I'd worked so hard to get, um, you know, we're almost 80% um, local vegetables, you know, from four or five specific growers. Uh, and that took us two years to get to that point. So I was devastated when it all kind of fell apart. I thought, oh, like Phil's farm, just about to, you know, they're just about to have to get tomatoes. We're just about to get, you know, what's going to happen? And, and I think a lot of them adapted, um, whether it was online, whether it was veggie boxes. And I think the support and what I kept seeing online was, I'm so sorry we've sold out. And I'm like, well, that's good. You know, that's all things. So it means that more people are doing it. Um, mm. And, you know, you start tagging everyone, check this this and, and I think with that community spirit really, um, really showed in that in that kind of situation. Um, um, thank you for that. That's good insight. Um, Andy, um, things from your perspective, we can see that Andy's in her delivery vehicle at the moment. So Red Cow Organics has made adjustments to their their business model in this disruption period. So if you could give us a bit of an overview on what you've seen and the thought processes that you've gone through to arrive where you're at today. Sure, I, I totally agree with what Massimo just said. It's that relationship is really what we've um, recognised in the last, probably the last 10 days, the, our business model has directly changed where previously we, um, our cheese is about celebration. Our cheese is about sharing with family and friends, whether that's at a dinner party or at a restaurant or a, or a celebration. So all of those things have been taken away from our customers. And unfortunately, um, we had to adjust pretty quickly. We had a whole core room full of, um, of cheese and cheese that um, has various um, different maturations as well. Some have a longer shelf life, some have a, quite a shorter shelf life. So we had to think, we're basically thinking on our feet every day, I'll be honest, um, and we need to adjust to what the world looks like. Our customers um, still want to have good quality food and they still want to be able to share that in their own home. The two things that we've found the impact is that we know that there'll be less money in the future in the economy. And so people are quite um, sensitive to, to where they spend and where they invest their, their money. And this is a all different demographics. Delivering this morning, there's a, a reach all different types of um, families and, and people where cheese is delivered to their door. So what we've done is we've set up our online model. Um, it's timely with Easter. It's, it's working quite well um, to celebrate that time of the year. 
and um, we've certainly been um, inundated and supported through different customers um, in our network, new customers in particular, and the, what Massimo touched on before is that relationship as well that we've um, reconnected with some of our customers from when we first started. They're actually purchasing in a different way where previously they would have purchased at Hill Street or a, their local Provador or, or celebrated that in, in, a, in a beautiful restaurant. So we've had to adjust. Um, technically, we've had to really think on our feet and get very savvy about how we put our, any promises out to our customers and make sure that you can support anything that you say because it does take a lot longer and your models have to think differently. Um, we feel busier than what we did you know, three or four weeks ago, but in a different way. And I think that's on top of that, that's a lot of anxiety and stress around what the future does look like because this is very short term. Um, and we are very considerate of what the community needs. Um, and not necessarily is high end cheese the first item, the staple item that a consumer will purchase, but there's that endeavour to support Tasmanian businesses and the endeavour to be able to get through this, whether it's three months, six months, 12 months, we, we really don't know. Um, I, I sincerely feel for our hospitality um, network and we have a lot of close friends that we've worked with for many years and, and it, it's, it's a challenge that we've got to stick together and, and we need to also look at the opportunities to collaborate further. Um, some producers that we're collaborating with have their own um, retail outlets um, attend harvest market, but some don't. So th this is a really big opportunity for them to look at business differently. Thank you very much, Andy. Some really good insights there. And, and I think you're right. Um, it is forcing people to look at their business models differently and how nimble and agile we can be in different types of incidents that occur. And so one of the things I'd be interested in once we get through this, this phase is whether some parts of your business model you will be looking at keeping, such as the delivery aspect. Well, um, there's a couple of things in that. Yes, we actually purchased a delivery van about three weeks, four weeks ago with the intention, intention to actually bring back out our bottled milk. Um, now that has been prioritised to a higher level because that is a, a product that will be a continual purchase um, and still complement that with our other products. But certainly um, the resources that are needed to be able to go online are so different to how you, we previously operated um, in a functional way. We're, we're, we're not just um, paddock to plate, but now we're actually out there selling door to door. So we've got a whole different sales mechanism um, and the customer still remains the same. However, we've got to understand how we get that efficiently and continue your promise to get it to, come to our customers. Thanks, Andy. Um, Leah, if I could move through to you now and if you could provide an overview of the initiatives that Eat Well Tasmania is working on. Okay. <clears throat> so firstly, deep respect to all the producers and um, people in hospitality um, we know how profoundly they've been impacted by these changes and we look forward to supporting you when, when that part of the food sector reawakens here in Tassie. I mean, like other people, we noticed that there was a really rapid shift in what people were doing from a consumer perspective. It was quite, there was almost like you could flick a switch and something changed. That's how dramatic it was. EWell does most of its communicating actually via um, social media. We're on um, Facebook and we're also on Instagram. And because we're communicating with people, we're also watching what's happening on there. And what we saw happening was that there was this huge thirst for knowledge about how um, everyday Tasmanians could actually buy Tasmanian and support um, Tasmanian owned businesses as well. So uh, after we watched it for a short time, we then actually made a submission to the state government from it for some additional funding so that we could deliver a project that's about explicitly about connecting home cooks with all of the different ways that they can buy Tasmanian fresh food. 
and that's really that includes cheeses. Um, it includes um, you know it includes dairy, fruit and veg, meat, um, you know nuts, olive oils, all the things that we do exceptionally well here in Tasmania. Um, so we'll have an exciting new launch for something next Wednesday. I can't tell you too much, but I'm happy to say that um, it. I think it'll be very positive for anyone that has any business that's pivoted and now has an online store because we're essentially about connecting people. In some ways, we're not surprised by the changing consumer behaviour because our job is essentially to promote Tasmanian food to Tasmanians so they eat more of it, um, particularly seasonal food, because if you eat seasonal food, then you're accidentally eating healthy food. So we actually don't talk about healthy eating, we talk about seasonal eating. Um, and we've actually been watching some of the consumer research for several years. And there's a big chunk of consumers, or let's call them Tasmanians, who have developed a very different way about making decisions about why they buy food. It's very values driven. It's very, it's a very personal thing. And sometimes those values haven't necessarily made the difference at the point of purchase um, because people haven't been able to buy Tasmanian. They haven't been able to support Tasmanian, which is strange given the abundance we produce. But now they're actually making a bigger effort to seek out Tasmanian sourced food. Like it's really top of mind for them. So that sort of those values and those things they wanted to implement more, more are actually a really big priority. Um, so in the last um, couple of weeks, we've been speaking to a lot of retailers and um, um, private businesses, small scale producers. And, you know, it's a pretty consistent theme, particularly anyone in the horticultural space, the demand for Tasmanian food has really increased. And ironically, people are turning away from the places that they used to shop and they're now actually looking more at Tasmanian-owned supermarkets, for example, the IGA, Salamanca Fresh, Hill Street, those sort of stores in the, in the fresh produce area have, you know, been having record sales. So um, the shift is definitely on and we want to connect as many Tasmanians as we can to the opportunities to buy um, Tasmanian food and to support Tasmanian businesses. I think in the first week that this crisis really started to come home to us, I heard an interview on ABC radio and somebody with a very wise head, and I can't remember who it was, but said, you know, now's the time for Tasmanians to be thinking about what they want Tasmania to look like in six months time. And I think that's really where a lot of people are sitting. So we're thinking they want to support local businesses because they know in six months time that they really still want them to be there. Now it's hard to do that in the hospitality area, but for home cooks, it's actually relatively easy. And there are lots of new opportunities that are coming online all the time. So um, we'll continue to do what we've always done, which is to support Tasmanian um, growers, producers, retailers, um, and, and help make the connections and certainly, if you could look at the back end of our social media and my email, we know we're on the right track with this. So we can't wait to make it, have our big launch next Wednesday, um, which will be loud and proud and out there. Um, and we hope that it'll be really help, helpful for um, shoring up some of the Tasmanian businesses who have taken significant risk in pivoting their businesses and adjusting to what consumers want now we're right with you um, and we look forward to supporting you in the next few months. Well, that's great, Leah, and, and really support the Eat Well Tasmania initiative. And you and I have had a range of conversations around how important the how and why of farming is and the fact that the farmers are con significant contributors to the health and well-being of our communities through healthy, nutritious food. And I think one of the key things that will come through from this is the importance of what the sector does for the community. And one of the key things that we'll be working on, which connects into your initiative, is ensuring that more of our producers have the opportunity to deliver or develop their own online farm shops. So yep. then they can connect through to the initiative that you're looking at. So then there's that continuing connection 
through to the consumer. And I think that's really important. Um, Sam, can I hand over to you before we then go to Lucinda and um, just get you to provide an overview of Harvest Market and some of the adjustments that you've made to ensure that the, the stallholders that you had at Harvest Market have had the ability to enable continuation of supply and then potentially some of the thoughts you have around a broader supply base in your catchment area. Can do. Um, so it's worth noting that uh, Harvest Market Lawn Systems business is servicing our members, which are small businesses largely. Um, and then our second point of contact is our customers, those that interact. So really we just facilitate those groups. Um, and the various um, social interactions that occur there. Um, so essentially with Harvest, we faced initially the potential closure of the market, market, which affects all those small businesses and our patrons and where they get their food from. Um, there was a huge amount of uncertainty through that process. Uh, we followed a process that allowed us to identify risks we deemed that the risk was too high to carry the market on. Um, and then there was a bit more grey area and then we were considering whether or not we would um, continue that the market in its uh, original form. Uh, we chose to stick to our guns. I think that's been very positive for us. Um, but that whole process led to us developing an online platform. Um, our main aim through that process was supporting our producers um, because we need them to be there at the end of this event. Um, and we need our community to be purchasing things from them. It's a full circle. Um, so Harvest, you know, has had to develop this, pro this um, online platform rapidly. There's definitely been gaps um, that we've had to step back and fill. Um, there's been a huge amount of uh, business structural change that we've had to do and are continuing to do, um, which I'm sure everyone's feeling. Um, and then it's about planning for the future and how we move forward um, and re-engage with the community after this. Um, as everyone stated so far, there has been this upswell of community support. Harvest been very fortunate in the fact that A, that's occurred, but we've always had good community following. Um, and we hope that we're fostering that now and will continue to into the future. Um, we are still looking at future developments for Harvest. Um, we need to do that for our members. Uh, our organisation is run for our members, as all organization, <laughs> membership organisations are. Um, I suppose what everyone wants to know is whether or not we're expa expanding our platform to involve people that aren't members. Um, at this point, uh, the answer to that question is yes, but we're not at that stage yet. Um, our members and our local community are our first priority and will continue to be our first priority until we can get enough breathing, breathing space to um, start filling in other gaps. So yes, we are looking to expand that platform to allow others in. Um, Harvest Market has a pretty strong ethos around what we allow um, and we'll be looking to maintain that. Um, but most small businesses sort of fit into that slot. And that slot is you know, being locally produced, manufactured, uh, made from Tasmanian produce, uh, food, is one of the <laughs> stopping points for a lot of people. Um, yeah, and then the next stage is planning for returning to business as normal. Normal inverted commas, of course. Um, that's something that we're starting to think about um, as, a part, uh, as well as that uh, community re-engagement as has been stated we're not sure what things are going to look like the other side of this, both economically, socially, 
um, and with our community in general. Um, yes, that's so, going to be an interesting phase, isn't it, Sam? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, in my uh, current role, I get to talk to a lot of business people and uh, there's, there's a lot of optimism out there um, and that's what we need to hang on to. But there's definitely a sense of dread for many. Um, and being a business facilitator, let's say that, um, that's something that we need to be very aware of um, because we can't do business without other businesses. Thank you. And, and that's, that's a great segue to Lucinda. And thank you very much for waiting there, Lucinda. What thank sort you. of things have you noticed you. from the Tamer Valley oh, business? Um, probably that, oh, I'd probably say 50% of businesses are shut um, because of all the interactions and the procedures and as such. We actually shut two weeks ago as well. Um, we made the call because we are a very community-based cafe and restaurant and people just want to sit and chat all day. And unfortunately, they couldn't do that. So we moved very quickly and changed our layout from seating 30 people to 11 people and you know it continued over two days and then we made the call that we'll just do takeaway for two days and then in that two days I decided I made the decision that it wasn't good enough for us to be we're becoming a hub outside our business and people were still congregating and I couldn't live with myself if something happened with those people up the top of the tamer we have a lot of older generations um, and I couldn't do that to expose them to anything um, I think you know for all businesses we're very tourism up the top so we've got Seahorse World we've got the Platypus House we've got the Beaconsfield Mine and Heritage Museum uh, we've got Miners Gold Brewery they all shut relatively early because of the tourism had dropped down um, but I've noticed a lot of the businesses have resorted to going to online procedures. So I was talking to Birch Grove Nursery this morning and they were saying that, you know, to purchase a plant, for instance, from a nursery, you can get a photo sent through to you. You can have all these, you know, different things done for you so that you could actually purchase it and you could pick it up from your doorstep on your only necessity trip out, you know? So, I think a lot of people are sitting tight and they're doing the whole hibernation thing as I, as I am. Um, we are looking at developing and all my producers that I use in the cafe that we can bring them all together as well as business members of, of our association to do some sort of goodness box. So local Tamar Valley eggs, local Lentara Grove olive oil, um, Blueberry Hills, you know, farm, um, all different sorts of things. So I think people are very uncertain at the moment and they're eager to get back already. Like I still go into the shop to check the fridges and to check the coffee machine and things like that. So, and I always see them on the street trying to come into the shop, even when the lights are off. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> we just got to play it out and we've just got to wait. Um, and people are going to be there to support us. And I know the community's there because we're all talking to each other. We all ring each other. Um, my biggest concern is the old ones that don't have the technology to mm -hmm. connect. So through Insta and Facebook and all that sort of stuff. And I don't know what else we're going to do apart from letterbox drops to let them know there is a phone call here for you if you need anything. I know people are looking out for neighbours. I mean, I live on 20 acres, so I'm very lucky. And I can wave to my neighbour and say, hello, how are you going, without any interaction, really. So um, the whole Tamar region, even I live on the West Tamar Highway. So it's actually quite a busy road. Um, and I've noticed in the last two weeks, the drop off of the amount of cars travelling. So we're still getting our milk trucks and our logging trucks and things like that. And traits, that's all I really see, which is great. So people are staying home. So, I, I mean, from the T Tamar Valley Business Association, we want to continue to support our members and to grow our membership base, obviously, but also to connect everybody. So one of our big things that we do is a lot of networking. 
and we were meant to have a networking um, function on the 20th of March at Cabbage Tree Hill. And so, I mean, obviously that was cancelled, but, you know, we all need to stick together. And I think by us being businesses and supporting and talking and throwing ideas off each other, that we can come through this. And I've got two, I've got a teenage son and a 23 year old chef. So I'm always throwing things off them and they're always throwing things off me. <laughs> so it's great to, you know, get their feedback from another generation as well. There's really important points you've raised, Lucinda, about community connection and how through food, we, that's one of the main connectors we, we have as communities is how we connect through our food. And so the ideas that you have around um, dropping letters in to people in your community that might necessarily be able to get out, but also um, may need um, some a change in their diet. So even just providing them with an opportunity to drop something in, whether it's cakes or something of that nature, just so that there's that that connection there, I think is really important. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for those insights. I'm now going to start on a range of questions. Sam, I'll start this one with you from Louisa. Um, Louisa notes that she agrees with everything that we're saying, but there's a concern that there's not an understanding in the community where product from the larger scale producers ends up. So prime lamb and beef, for example. So are you able to provide any insight in relation to that? Because we know one of the key things for me and, and connecting in with Massimo's work and the uh, values that he has around supporting local and niche is also the larger end of town that put product through into larger supply chains. So can you provide any insight on that? Uh, well, the supply chain into harvest is short. So those producers are producing their own beef. That's just one of the rules. They have to produce, grow, however, whatever the situation is, their own products. So in our instance, we know exactly where it's coming from. And in some instances, moving to. Um, with regards to larger producers, moving into the future and certainty there. I mean, in that landscape, it's a commodity, so it's traded internationally. And how that's going to be managed moving forward, don't know. We know that supply chains are complex and intricate beasts, shall we call it. Um, <laughs> and it's not as simple as some people might think, unfortunately. Um, uh, it's it's largely going to be a wait and see. We're just going to have to see where everything falls at the end of the day and work yeah. it out from there. I mean, there's still a lot of optimism. There's still good prices for lots of things. Um, I note that wool's gone down a bit, but that's to be expected. Um, people still need to eat. They don't necessarily need to buy a $200 woolen jumper in China. Um, and that's just the reality of it. We're just going to have to manage it as we go along. Massimo, have you got anything to add in relation to um, larger scale producers and potential options there? Yeah, well, I think um, we sometimes we focus on niche products and it's not always about um, the small, small farm. There is, it's about Tasmania. So mm. whether that... Um, is from one farm or the other farm, like it's about traceability and, and provenance. So um, the, the complex thing is, is getting the truth sometimes about where the product's from, um, you know, where it's been actually processed. Um, so it's just getting that honesty, that feedback from, uh, and I get it a lot from the actual industry. Like if I, I meet farmers and I sit down and have a beer with them or have a cup of tea, and then they give me their insight and I find out all the information um, so for me, like, it's always about, you know, um, supporting just that one small hobby farmer or small producer because that's not viable. And what I've learned in the restaurant is it doesn't work. Um, it's great for a special and it's great to, um, to, to kind of um, make uh, a beautiful dish or, or, or a special event out of that, but it's not viable for a commercial 
business. So I've really um, tried really hard to kind of meet more and more farmers. And if the lamb is from, um, you know, is processed in Tasmania, it's from um, up near Sheffield, then it's Tasmanian lamb. I, I don't, um, it's, not, it's just, I don't want to go and support something from outside of the state. That's, that's my biggest thing. Um, and it just comes down to people trusting um, the industry. I think we need to have someone saying, this lamb, this is where it's from, this is who you're supporting, and just have that kind of uh, information transparent and let people make their options. Um, it's not always about buying, you know, the small niche products. Mm. Um, I do it for, I, I basically do it for that relationship. You know, I went to, I went to, um, Farmgate on Sunday because um, I really wanted, you know, Larry and Alison's um, real beef burgers for the kids. Um, and I made a point of going to do that because I know them, they're friends now, and I want to support them. And it wasn't, um, that's, just, that's just my belief, you know, I guess that's my thing. Um, but today I went down to the butcher and saw Marcus and bought, you know, things for the, for the home. So... It's just knowing that I'm doing the right thing for me and I feel a lot better doing it. Um, and I think, I don't want to say going to the supermarket is the wrong thing. It's not. It's just we've got to make our own educated guess um, decision to know what we want to do. No, thank you very much for that. Some really good insights there. And I think, um, Lair, I'll come to you in a minute and then I've got a question for Andy. I think one of the key things is that communication and understanding, again, that connection with producers, knowing where our foods come from and supporting that, that Tasmanian provenance, I think is really, really important and key and um, critical to ensuring the next six months, six months after that, that we've got a, a really strong, vibrant sector. Um, Leah, you wanted to comment to Nathana? I just wanted to make one comment, um, particularly around um, uh, large scale production. Um, Eat Well, actually, we were in the middle of a project looking at um, local food procurement. So we've been doing some research and working with the university around how it was that we could actually influence the um, Tasmanian supply chain so that large institutions, so universities, prisons, hospitals, aged care, etc., cetera, um, could source more of the fresh produce that they use um, whether it's fruit and veggies, meat, olive oils, whatever, um, that they would source more from Tasmania, Tasma Tasmanian producers. Um, overseas, um, there's been, uh, well, well, unfortunately, we're a little bit behind in Australia. Overseas, particularly in um, North America and Europe, they've, for about 10 years, um, at sort of state government, regional government levels, had a real commitment to any institutions that they run, procure, having policies to actually procure more locally produced food to support the industry. And because you're talking about literally hundreds of thousands of meals, it means working with um, local large scale producers so that they can supply into those supply chains as well. Um, we'll continue to pursue that. In fact, we'll take up the conversation um, with the state government in a few weeks time Anybody who's um, watching here, um, if they want to, they can go to the Eat Well Tasmania website and you'll actually find a page around local procurement and the kind of work that we were midstream kind of trying to do because, I mean, we don't mind who grows or produces food, whether it's a small-scale producer or it's a large-scale producer. We just want Tasmanians, irrespective of where they're eating their meal, to be able to eat more Tasmanian food. Um, so, yes, we're all for um, ensuring that there are good opportunities that protect livelihoods and build some resilience in our system as well so that when these shocks happen, um, we're, we're better prepared, better networked um, for next time. Thanks, Leah. Some really good insights there and, and shows the importance of going into the different procurement areas in those government areas also to... to promote Tasmanian produce. There's some chats coming through which have got some really interesting points that um, our participants can look at. Andy, I've got a question for you. I'm just wondering if you're passing on the cost of delivery to your customers. Um, the questioner is assuming 
it's a huge cost, especially from a time point of view. And unfortunately, many farmers or producers don't have the manpower to do home deliveries. What's your view on that? Um, yeah, it, it is a difficult one um, because firstly, you want to be able to move your product to your customer. Um, being able to value your time um, and whether it's an employee or your time to deliver to the customer, it's a really difficult one in the current economic climate. Um, we actually put an example as we put a, um, a special price out um, um, proposal for Easter and um, that included free freight in parts of Tasmania. And then it just grew and then it went to Launceston and then to Hobart. So we had to honour that. Um, so look, it, there are some um, inefficiencies. However, um, we're learning through the, 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 the early days of being able to develop something that's direct to customer. The customer doesn't mind paying freight as long as it's reasonable and it's respected uh, in a time frame, particularly with um, chilled freight as well. If we were to put on a, a, um, a commercial freight company to distribute each of our um, cheese boxes, it, it's going to significantly increase the price. So we need to be realistic about getting that product to our customer. Um, in the question around resources, yes. That's one opportunity there where there's some collaboration between producers where um, the current set up for some companies that they can't deliver themselves and not everybody has the capacity to do that because we're, we're traveling long, you know, long distances and, and long hours to deliver individual um, uh, cheese boxes at the moment. So we've collaborated and made sure that we've also um, included another local business as well and we've shared some freight areas with her. So that shares the um, mm. delivery costs, but it also um, shows the importance of um, sharing businesses together. And I, I think you really have to, a lot of, a lot of um, farmers won't know their costs until they actually go, sit down and analyse it very, very much in detail, because you need to be really careful about the freight costs can actually blow things out and not be profitable in your business. You've got to be really careful, um, but also you've got to be prepared to service your customers' needs. And the, our customers at the moment, they're at home. So we've got to find that middle ground. And it's not easy, and I'm sure Harvest have had very similar experiences too, trying to deliver in a respectable price point as well. Customer, like I said, my main point is that customers don't mind paying freight, and everybody already does because um, we live on an island and we already pay a lot of freight bringing our product, whether it's a um, you know, machinery or equipment or packing equipment, we already pay freight to come into our state. But in our current environment right now, we want to be able to make our product affordable for customers, but also be profitable in our business. Yeah, look, some really good points there, Andy. Mm. And one of the ones that really stuck out for me is for producers knowing their cost of production. If you really know your cost of production per item that you're producing, then you've got the ability to be able to make those decisions that you have around delivery price points and how you need to adjust your business model to bring in those different types of add-ons that you're doing at the moment. And even online stores, if you're providing the opportunity of an online mechanism, you need to factor in delivery components there as well about postage and other aspects that might come with highly perishable foods. So definitely a key point that you've raised there. Um, I'll move on to Alex. She's asked, why do we export certain products to the mainland, for example, lettuce or onions, only to find in our local supermarkets that the same product has been imported into Tasmania from a mainland or even overseas grower? What is behind this? A really good question. And, and this comes to um, uh, the, the, main, the main retailers, uh, price point, a whole range of different aspects. One key thing from my point of view before I hand over to a couple of panellists to comment is Leah's point about seasonality. We all expect now when we go to the supermarket to have uh, different types of product on the shelf all year round. Now, we know that we can't grow that in Tasmania all year round. 
So the retailers will then go to other countries, other states of Australia to bring that product in because that's what the, the consumer is expecting when they go into the supermarket. We've lost this capacity to understand what seasonality is and what it means around the health and nutrition of the food that we're consuming. I think the other point is price point uh, with retailers and competing and the current low cost model that we have in Australia at the moment. And one of the key findings that I found in my Churchill Fellowship last year is how Europe and the UK are moving to a true cost model where they recognise that for future food security, they need to ensure that the supply chain pays the farmer what it costs to produce that food. So yes, that means the consumer is paying a little bit more, but it means that the consumer is getting the local product that they're expecting to purchase. So we need to somehow have some influence on the supply chain so that the retailers are moving away from this low cost poor nutrition-based food model to something that's more reflective of what the community needs. So I'll jump off my soapbox now and maybe move to Massimo if you've got any comment in relation oh, to that. Oh, um, look, you know, going to the supermarket in the middle of winter and finding asparagus from Mexico is, is a great example of just what you said. Um, why is it there, you know? Um, um, is the demand? Is it because people want to, you know, use that ingredient in the middle of winter? I don't know. I think um, if we could somehow get people to taste the difference of actually eating something in season, and the perfect example of that is um, yesterday, I, I, I made a, a really um, quick sautéed greens, and I and I used my own silver beet, which I'm very lucky that I've been able to grow. Not very well, but I, I, I've given it a go. And um, and it was just incredibly tasty. It was delicious. You know, it, it's it's in season right now. And I think, and I shared that with my wife, and I do taste it. And I think maybe um, the consumers ha are not aware of that, haven't been educated in that. Like, um, we're so used to just buying whatever we want when we want it. And I think, you know, I think... Um, Issues like eat well and and just people on, on social media in general, um, just keep harp on harp on about it. Keep reminding people that what's available right now. This is what you should be doing. And you know, as the kidneys just finished, I can't wait to come back. You know, um, someone's going to go in the supermarket and want to make a zucchini slice. So they they just there's that, that expectation there. So if if the supermarkets don't buy it, we won't use it. So how do we get them to stop? That's the thing. It's not about getting to stop buying it. Stop them putting it in the supermarkets. Mm. Big big task, I know. Um, that's where it's got to start. Yeah. So I look, I think just slowly there's a recognition through some of the key buyers in these retail spaces that they need to support local, but. Again, it's the demand that they're reacting from from a mainstream consumer. And this is where the important initiatives like Leah is working on, Harvest Market, also um, Andy and uh, Lucinda's area, where we're all in our varying ways trying to encourage people to connect with local, to recognise seasonality and get those life skills back that we're going back to how... We used to cook and used to harvest in the 70s and back further where it was all about the traditional way of doing things. Um, Christine Manns just asked a question, Andy, if customers are within 20 kilometres of someone like yourself, could they call and collect a bit like click and collect? Well, actually, I had a customer request that this morning. Um, I'm, I'm quite conscious um, about not doing that um, and social distancing and being able to leave our product, um, in a, uh, put our product in a safe way because it needs to be refrigerated. Someone has to be there to serve the customer. Um, it forms into being a shop for us. So I'm very conscious about not um, creating that environment. So I've avoided that. Um, it's not to say that someone else may have be comfortable in that 
doing that, but I, I haven't entertained that with our customers. Mm, no, thanks for that. Um, Sam, what about <laughs> Harvest Market and um, models moving future around potential click and collect? I know that we have to practice the appropriate social distancing at the moment and your online and delivery models that you're looking at is endeavouring to ensure there's a continuity of supply there. What are your thoughts on that? So we're probably in the same frame, frame, of, frame of mind as Andy. Uh, although we are looking at it, we do have um, as part of our charter some requirements to push to um, connect with individuals that may not be able to connect us with us um, in our normal sense, but now also on top of uh, on top of that with our um, electronic platform. So we are looking into ways that we can facilitate a click and collect. Um, there will be, how far away that is, I'm not sure. Um, there will be very strict guidelines around how we administer that um, because there is risk, but we also need to make sure that we can continue it. If we invest in something like that, um, it's going to mean infrastructure, it's going to mean staff, it's going to mean, um, you know, equipment, whatever. We're going, there's a lot to consider and we would, you know, like to get to a point where we could, but we don't want to put other people's business at, businesses at risk either, mm -hmm. um, get them all geared up to do it, and then somebody pulls the rug out from underneath us. So these are just risks that we need to manage. Thanks, Sam. Um, Lucinda, with your business, is something like a click and collect or even an online ordering system with your businesses is that something that you've contemplated or people in your network are contemplating? Yeah, um, we're contemplating it at the moment. Um, we're lucky enough we have a premises that have three doors. So we can actually do contactless pickup and connect and still have it refrigerated. Um, it just means a lot of cleaning. A lot of places like Honey Tasmania have gone on to online platforms only now. Um, I think just can I just rehash back a bit about the educating of people and seasonal eating is that I've noticed a lot on Instagram because I love Instagram. Um, so many people are doing more back to the old school ways of preserving, pickling and using that produce throughout the whole year and to get them through. And I think it's about educating. Like I grew up with a grandmother where I remember sitting on her washing machine tub making tomato jam. So, and my kids now are teaching me how to do it, <laughs> which is great. So I think it's about educating people and it doesn't, just because it's pickled or preserved doesn't mean it doesn't taste good. I think the stigma around that, I think if you were born between the 1980s to 2000, you're kind of worried that it's tin food or jarred food, but it's preserved in a way and it still retains absolute, you know, beautiful amounts of flavour. So I think people are just scared. And I think that's something that as a Tasmanian, you know, island that we have, that we can use that to our advantage. And then, you know, in the foreseeable future, that when people want it, because when all this COVID's over, well, not over, but, you know, our borders are let down a little bit, just in, in, just in Australia, that people from Australia will travel around Australia. And they're going to want to go to places where they can get the best produce, best tasting stuff. And that's where I think we need to look forward and to plan for. Um, I think it's very important. I mean, that, you know, we're doing all these right things at the moment and it's all uncharted territory. So we don't know exactly what we're doing. Um, it's very much like a wartime scenario where, you know, you should look out for your neighbour and you should look out for your community, but educate the young ones as well. So starting off with children in schools, for instance, they should have a program where in your tuck shop, you only have seasonal stuff. You don't have deep fried. You don't have chips and pizza and, and stuff like that. You know, you have cherry tomatoes and carrot sticks and, you know, different things at different times of the year. Um, but for saying that, also going back, um, a lot of businesses, you know, we're kind of, we're just trying to hash it out at the moment. 
and trying to work out what's going to work for us to make sure we've got the money for to restart. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a very much a playing game. Like there's a business in Beauty Point which does training on divers. So there's only two places in the world that do it, us and Ireland. So it's a very important thing for him to be able to keep getting those people in to train them for deep sea diving and training and all sorts of things. Um, I mean, we're such a large, I mean, we're, so, we're such a large country, but we're, we're, our, we're our own little country, right, in Tassie. So um, that's how I feel anyway. <laughs> um, we need to all support each other. And I think we're all doing that. And by having a panel like this, this is fantastic. And I thank you for inviting me on this. It's well, fantastic. Thank you very much for your insight, Lucinda. Some really good points there. We, we've reached two o'clock. How quickly has that gone? I will say on the weekend, my preserving kit did get a workout. So my family's going to be eating pears for a long time. So <laughs> we haven't had the chance today to answer all of the questions that were raised. But I'd like to um, thank people for raising questions. We'll do this again. This session has been recorded, so we'll make sure that it's up on our Facebook feeds for people to access. And please share around your network so that we can make sure that we maintain connected and people can get some ideas on what we've discussed. Coming up uh, next week, the week after Easter, from the 14th to the 15th of April, Tasmanian Women in Agriculture are offering our members and also members in our network the opportunity to undertake e-learning training. It's for two hours on how they can develop their own online farm shop. So please look out for that and take up the opportunity because then that will enable you to then develop your own farm shop, connect to consumers and then hopefully also link into the initiatives that Leah's talking about around Eat Well Tasmania as well. I'd like to also sincerely thank all our panellists today for participating. Terrific comments there. And hopefully, please um, take on board what they've said. Think about some of the ways that we can adjust all our own business models. And also, finally, remember to promote our hashtag of hashtag buy Tasmanian first. Thank you very much, everybody, and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.